Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. Oh, there's so many things to go over and so much goodness for you in today's show. You're really going to enjoy the next two hours or hour, however long you choose to stay with us. You're going to enjoy it. The Iowa caucuses were last night and resulted in a landslide victory for former President Donald Trump. The race was called just 30 minutes into the night causing a wave of blowback across social media and campaigns, especially from the DeSantis camp, which, you know, they were unhappy that while voters were still waiting to caucus, they'd been told their votes weren't necessary and that it was already being called for Trump. DeSantis took a distant second. Nikki Haley finished just behind him in third. Uh, but in a speech last night, she says Iowa, even though she came in third, has now officially made this a two-person race, which... Which two people? <laughs> Donald Trump and Joe Biden? That, I see that. Uh, both uh, she and DeSantis will move to New Hampshire next, but Vivek Ramaswamy dropped out and endorsed Trump. The results gave us, oh, by the way, Asa Hutchinson just dropped out too. The results gave us some incredible media meltdowns. That's my favorite part of the day. Wait until you see what we have assembled for you. And joining us now to discuss it all, Stu Bergier, host of Stu Does America, and Dave Marcus, Daily Mail and Fox News, etc. columnist. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. Let's discuss a crucial aspect of your financial health, your credit report. It's time to face a hard truth. Your credit report could be suffering due to unfounded reputation damaging claims. These are the kind of claims that simply will not hold up under rigorous scrutiny. And that is where Lexington Law Firm comes into play. For less than $100, Lexington Law champions your cause using a comprehensive arsenal of consumer protection laws to fight for your best credit report. Lexington Law is fully equipped to challenge those exploitative creditors and aggressive debt collectors who obstruct your financial path. Go and visit LexingtonLaw.com for a complimentary credit assessment. Let their experts place your credit under the microscope, ensuring that it reflects your true financial story. And remember to tell them that Megan referred you when you go. Again, it's LexingtonLaw.com. Empower yourself with the right team on your side. Guys, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Thanks Megan. For me. uh, okay, so Trump won and he won bigly. And can we, let's just start there because my number one impression watching it last night was what a stunning, stunning comeback. Like they, just go back to after January 6th of 2020 and how everyone associated with Team Trump was being banned. They couldn't get book deals. They were on blacklists not to hire them or allow them to do speeches or anything. And it was like out of the question. I remember on the second Trump impeachment, people were saying, what are you, don't be ridiculous. It's not necessary. He could never be reelected after this. Of course, you don't need to impeach him to prevent it. After all that and four indictments, and you know, even today he's back at another defamation trial with E. Jean Carroll, who some jury found him liable for allegedly sexually assaulting and then defaming. The man, he does feel untouchable and indestructible and invincible in some ways. And that's what we saw last night for him to come back and not just eke out a victory in Iowa, Stu, but crush it with over majority vote. I mean, it's a stunning, stunning political comeback. And he's pulled off how many of these? It, it really is incredible, Megan, you're right. And it's funny watching after the January 6th situation, it did feel like that. It did feel like many Republicans were even changing uh, their view on Trump and and maybe abandoning him as, as so many wanted them to. And it's funny. I mean, even the New York Times wrote just the other day in a very rare, somewhat positive piece about Donald Trump was talking about how college educated Republican voters came back to Trump after January 6th. They really did leave. I mean, the base stayed pretty loyal to Trump through that period. But the voters who were college educated, white suburban voters, sort of abandoned Trump for over a year. It wasn't until March of 2023 when that first indictment hit, when they all came rushing back. At that point, you had a situation where Ron DeSantis looked like a real challenger, looked like it was potentially a really competitive primary. 
And the left, as they have done over and over again throughout history, overplayed their hand and decided Mm -hmm. that they couldn't just win. They couldn't just have a situation where they decided to beat him if he was going to run again. They couldn't do that. Instead, they had to get their legal system involved and go after him every which way. People get defensive when they see someone being targeted by the government like that, especially Republicans, conservatives, who looked at that and said, wait a minute, this is crazy. They're going to try to take him off the ballot. They're going to try to put him in prison. And the people who kind of didn't align with Donald Trump and probably are responsible for him losing in 2020 came back rushing in, supported him through this primary process, and it results in a blowout in Iowa. Mm. Dave, what did you make of it? I mean, I just don't, we've never seen anything like this, like Trump's resilience and the affection that a, you know, a huge portion of the Republican Party, no, it's not all, has for him. Yeah, I, I really wasn't surprised that this was exactly what I expected would happen. Um, look, Republican voters like Trump. Uh, Stu's right that after January 6th, there was like, you know, a cup of coffee when people were like, oh, no. But I mean, four or five days later, the polling was clearly showing that voters were still behind Trump. McCarthy and and all of the rest of the politicians sort of fell in line. I will say this. Uh, about last night, though, I think Nikki Haley is absolutely right that this is a two person race between her and Donald Trump at this point. And I'll tell you why. I want to preface this by saying I think Trump will almost certainly win the nomination. But uh, I'm of the school of thought that there's a Rocky analogy for everything. And the analogy here is Rocky Four, right? Ivan okay. Drago, unbeatable. He he killed Apollo Creed. Rocky's getting destroyed by him. Rocky throws a punch and cuts him, right? The big Russian is cut. It's a bad cut. That if there is a chance to beat Trump, that's the only way. She needs to win New Hampshire. Maybe then people say, oh, this isn't inevitable and she does okay. Look, it's a long shot. DeSantis doesn't even have that anymore. DeSantis really ought to drop out today and endorse Donald Trump. All right, we'll get to all of those folks too because I do want to go through each of them and talk about their future course. Uh, Trump last night on the stage was, I mean, he, you know, he's got this gear where he can be kind of sweet- and, you know, soft in a nice way, not in a bad way. Um, and he referred to DeSantis and Haley as Ron and Nikki. Uh, he praised Vivek. He had a kind word for Melania, who just lost her mom. In fact, we have a little bit of that cut. Listen here. I want to thank uh, some of the great people. We have so many senators. If I go through every name, we'll be here all night and everybody's going to get angry at me. But the senators, the congressmen from Washington, they came down from all different states. I want to thank you very much. I want to congratulate Ron and Nikki for having a, a, good, a good time together. We're all having a good time together. And most importantly, I want to thank my incredible wife, uh, first lady, I'll say former and maybe future. But more important than Melania, I want to thank her incredible, beautiful mother who passed away a few days ago. And she's up there, way up there. She's looking down and she's so proud of us. And I just want to say to Amalia, you are special. One of the most special people I've ever known. Boy, did she take care of Baron. That's how he got so tall. He only ate her food. Uh, It's nice to see Trump do those moments. He doesn't do a lot of those moments. You could just tell he was in a very good mood. I don't know. To me, it seemed like almost a page turner moment for him. Like, The nastiness between him and most Republicans, I think in a way was put to bed last night. I think the party knows it's inevitable. And I think already now you're seeing some tweets and posts on X from people who are diehard DeSantis supporters saying, it's time, like it's time. The the, the money, the effort, the energy needs to go into supporting our obvious inevitable nominee and um, fighting Joe Biden, not fighting amongst ourselves. What do you think of it? Dave. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's I, I think that's right, especially from uh, the DeSantis side. I, I did think it was very interesting to watch DeSantis and Haley's speeches, right? Because uh, DeSantis kind of blamed the media, you know, referencing back to what you said about you, you know uh, calling the race too early and stuff. He really didn't talk about Trump. Haley, on the other hand, really went after Trump, comparing Trump to Joe Biden, talking about how nobody wants a Biden versus Trump race, which, according to polling, is 
sort of true. I, the thing that that's interested me is that Haley has no major social media presence, right? Um, she ran much more of a sort of standard campaign. And Trump and DeSantis supporters are kind of like vegans. Um, you know that about them within five minutes of meeting them. Uh, <laughs> Haley voted... Yeah, I mean, Haley voters aren't that way. I've I've met them. Everyone's like, I've never met a Haley, but well, I go out and talk to people. I've met them. They're I just know tons they're not of Haley on supporters. X. I completely What's agree that? with you. I've seen I've seen the same thing. I've seen people people posting on X. I've never seen anybody post on here about Nikki Haley that likes her. Well, maybe maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But like, if you talk to any sort of quote mainstream Republicans, the odds are they're Haley supporters. Most of my yeah. friends who are Jewish Republicans are Haley supporters. Like there there are. Obviously, there's a huge number of Republicans who love Nikki Haley. You're right. They're just not posting about her on X all the time. Yeah. And Megan, I bet those friends are not up at one o'clock in the morning furiously, like, you know, arguing with a non bots about the 2024 election. Right. Yeah. In fact, I, I mean, I, the, the group I just referenced is worried about their survival. Uh, so they've mm -hmm. got bigger things to worry about than X post. They want somebody who's more hawkish like Nikki Haley. I realize it's a no go for a large portion of the Republican Party, but it's nonsense to say she has no real life supporters. Dave, what do you make of it? Because I think Trump was softer there for a reason. I really think like he, it, look, in 16, he was considered even more still, he was considered more uh, divisive than he is now, I think, uh, by Republicans at least. I think the Republican Party's a little warmer toward, toward him today than they were in 16, where they didn't want him. They couldn't believe this guy was taking over their party. Over 90% of the Republican Party came home for Trump in 16. They came home for Trump after that divisive election. They're gonna come home for Trump this time too. And I think that's that's what accounts for the shift in tone by him, not by Nikki, no, but by him. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of politicians go through this process and when they're trying to win over votes, they're very endearing to the public. They're, they, they're very endearing to their opponents. And then when they win, they have that temptation to kind of be like, yeah, in your face, I won. Trump is the exact opposite. When he has that approach, the approach that you played earlier, that's when he's 100% sure he's won. When he is gets gets that point that everything is is in his column, he becomes this more mag magnanimous person. And he's very capable of that. I mean, at times, I think he should utilize it a lot more because I think it is really endearing to people, especially because he has that gruff sort of offensive uh, in-your-face persona most of the time. When he hits those notes, I, they're actually really powerful. I mean, he, if you watch his last few weeks of the 2016 campaign, he was there often. And in his uh, acceptance speech, when he won the presidency, he he hit that tone as well. And I think it was really well received. You know, it's it's just interesting to see his power over the party now. You're right. In 2016, there was a totally different situation going on. I mean, people could, there's a, a good chunk of the party that went to the polls. We talked to them day after day after day on the radio who were completely holding their nose in November, going to pull the lever for him thinking of coming up with any justification they could, the Supreme Court, something, anything they could to try to pull the lever for them. Most of them wound up doing it, but not happily. That was not the case in 2020. People were happy about generally the policies that he had pushed through and, and generally liked his presidency. And despite all of the, everything that's happened, the soap opera that ex has existed over the past few years, uh, it has not shaken most of them. And in some ways, I think has really tightened the connection between Trump and his base. Because, I mean, if you look at the, the entrance polls uh, last night, what you find is about two thirds of the people believe the election was stolen. And, you know, taking out whatever you think about that or whatever you might feel, whether it was stolen or not, taking that out, how do you beat a person who's in that position? Because that person has something that no one else can have. They had, in their eyes, the election, the presidency stolen from them. And if the presidency was stolen from Donald Trump, the rational response is that he gets another shot at it. And the people who believe that, and it's two thirds of the electorate, voted for Donald Trump by over 50 points. It's almost insurmountable, no matter what candidate you are and, and what candidacy you run. Yeah, exactly. And so the, I, I do think there's gonna be a warming now towards Trump. Like he passed the first major contest challenge Look, DeSantis didn't drop out because he came in. He came in second. It was a, it was a distant second. Um, I think. What did he wind up with? Nineteen, and uh, they're they're he still like tabulating mm -hmm. the numbers. He had mm -hmm. he had twenty one, and Nikki Haley had around nineteen. He was, she was about mm -hmm. two or three points behind him. Um, I don't see the path. 
I don't see the path, Dave. He's got, he came in, Trump more than doubled his number. And he has no path at all in New Hampshire. DeSantis is not gonna win New Hampshire. And then they go to South Carolina where Trump is crushing even hometown favorite Nikki Haley, crushing her. So that's where DeSantis went right after Iowa last night. He didn't go to New Hampshire, though he's going back there later today for a CNN town hall. But it, it says something that he went directly to South Carolina, not to New Hampshire. And I know what he said last night is, I've earned my ticket. Here it is. I'll play you the soundbite, number three. Yeah, I've earned my ticket out of Iowa. What To where? Watch. They threw everything but the kitchen sink at us. The media was against us. They were writing our obituary months ago. They even called the election before people even got a chance to vote. They were predicting uh, that we wouldn't be able uh, to get our ticket punched here out of Iowa. But I can tell you, because of your support, in spite of all of that that they threw at us, everyone against us, we've got our ticket punched out of Iowa. Hmm. Hmm. I don't, I mean, you explain it to me. Take a punch to where? I mean, you know, to oblivion. I mean, you're absolutely right, Megan. He, he has no chance in New Hampshire. That's obviously why he's going to South Carolina. He has no chance uh, in South Carolina. I, I, I really don't understand why he'd even go uh, to New Hampshire because the fact of the matter is, in New Hampshire now, you have Haley at 29%, but you have Christie still at 11% in the RCP average, which, which you know puts her pretty close to Trump. If DeSantis were to drop out, he'd be handing New Hampshire... Uh, to Trump. So I, 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 I'm absolutely baffled. And I will say this, I watched that speech last night and I could be wrong about this. Like maybe this will come out eventually. I think Ron DeSantis gave his victory speech. It, it was absolutely bizarre. He's talking about George Washington and the civil war and this lofty language. It's like, you lost by a lot. Like the media said we were dead. You are like, like, <laughs> like what are you talking about? Like, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense what you're saying. I, I, I do. I, I think they didn't write a concession speech and he just went out and gave the victory speech anyway. Um, it, look, it's, it's, uh, maybe they need some time. There's stages of grief. I think you mentioned there are people yeah. sort of slowly coming around to this, but uh, yeah, just De DeSantis is finished. Yeah. Here's the thing. Um, John Cardillo, who's on X a lot, uh, Stu, he's been a big DeSantis supporter and he posted this post. The primary is basically over and so is my criticism of Trump. I've said what I thought. I wanted the more conservative guy. Americans have spoken. Our guy lost. Dems will destroy us. So all of our fire must be directed at them. 110% must be directed at the left. And there, you know, went on from there, but he's not the only one. I, I think- Look, I, I'm, I'd be thrilled to see Ron DeSantis go all the way through. It didn't happen. He needed to win Iowa. That's the reality. And now we just have to hold on until he realizes it too. As for Nikki Haley, I, I don't see a much better path for her. She's probably going to come in a strong second in New Hampshire. But let's give her the benefit of the doubt and say she comes in first in New Hampshire. <whistles> she comes in first in New Hampshire. He's then going to crush her in South Carolina and on Super Tuesday and that that when DeSantis drops out, the notion that the DeSantis supporters are then going to go to Haley is questionable at best. Yes, highly questionable and, and probably not going to happen. Um, you know, there's a new poll out in New Hampshire that has uh, the uh, the uh, a 40 40 tie between Trump and and uh, Nikki Haley. I mean, she really could win New Hampshire. I mean, it's largely because independent and Democrats are going to vote for her. And that's not really a sustainable way to win a Republican primary. However, the next state is South Carolina. She does have 25% of the vote there. And she is, you're right, still far behind Trump. But it's not, it's not theoretically impossible in her home state that if she wins New Hampshire, she gets a bump. She makes that close. I, I think if I'm in her campaign, I'm still trying to play this out and seeing what's, what happens. It's not completely impossible. I don't think it's sustainable. And, and in a way, oddly, you know, even with DeSantis finish, finishing second, there's more of a path for DeSantis to win the nomination than there is Haley. Just from the perspective of 70 percent of this population that's voting here are Donald Trump fans and none of them are Nikki Haley fans. So there's almost no crossover there. The people that are voting for Ron DeSantis uh, are 
generally Trump open. They're not they're not they're not, you know, the huge skeptics that are going to go to Nikki Haley. If Trump were to drop out or something, then you could see a path for Ron DeSantis. And that really is his path at this point. I mean, look, they this is a situation and I've been looking at this as a two tiered primary. You have the normal contest that we we've all become familiar with over the years where candidates vie to win. And there's a secondary contest going on that we have to acknowledge, which is they might just throw Trump in prison. Who knows what the Supreme Court says? They might just take him off the ballots. And if all those things start happening and, and the world goes crazy, I don't want to see the chaos that ensues from that. But there has to be a second choice in an election like this because of the unique circumstances with Donald Trump and what they're trying to do with him. I do think that it's important for us to look at these people and decide, hey, who is that second choice? Because it's they have 91 indictments uh, against Donald Trump. They're not going to go 0 for 91. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but they're going to go after him. And at some point, they may present a circumstance where you need to go to an alternate. Mm, I mean, it's true. It, it, it's very true. I don't think the party's going to voluntarily eject Trump after he's gotten the nomination. But if he's sitting in a prison cell this summer when they have their nominating convention, the, the party's going to be faced with a serious choice. And I don't, I don't know that they're going to nominate someone who's actually in jail, which is a slim possibility, but it is a possibility. So you're right. It's like, well, what's the backup? Who's the backup? Who's the first first tier backup, and perhaps that's a reason to keep this going. I don't know. Um, here's Nikki Haley messaging last night on that it's a two-person race. I'll play it for you, Sat for. When you look at how we're doing in New Hampshire, in South Carolina, and beyond, I can safely say tonight, Iowa made this Republican primary a two-person race. Okay, well, we'll see. I mean, boy, she's really going to have to have some rabbits in her hat. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, I want to talk about Vivek. He admitted reality, which is he has zero path forward um, and endorsed Trump. Not surprising. Uh, here's a little bit of what he said. Satu. As I've said since the beginning, there are two America first candidates in this race. And earlier tonight, I called Donald Trump to tell him that I... Congratulate him on his victory. And now going forward, he will have my full endorsement for the presidency. And I think we're going to do the right thing for this country. So he'll sound exactly the same tomorrow as he sounded yesterday in talking about Donald Trump, except for that last final closing message of if you really like him, you should vote for me. I have to say um, that's obviously the right course. He did not have a path forward in this nomination. But man, this has been a very fruitful and consequential run for him. Uh, his name recognition has gone way up. His social media presence and following has gone way up. And he's created a lane within the Republican Party. It's like a sliver within MAGA that really loves him and that sees him as the next generation Trump. So I really think he might be like the Tim Scott message of not no, but not now kind of candidate. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that, that he, he, he does have a lane. I think Haley has a lane. I think DeSantis has a lane. Donald Trump is almost certainly going to be the nominee. Whether he wins the general election or loses, though, there's going to be a Republican Party after Donald Trump. And, and, and that's a lot of what this race is about. So for, Nick, for Nikki Haley, for example, if Nikki Haley were to just stick around and be getting 20, 25 percent, you know, here and there and was obviously the second place candidate in the 2024 GOP nomination, that's very good for the more hawkish people who want to give money to Ukraine, who are the, the, the staunch allies of Israel, people like that. Uh, Vivek obviously wants to throw Israel under the bus, wants to throw Ukraine under the bus. And there is a there's a, a part of the, the GOP electorate that's on board with that. So I think underneath Trump, watching all of this stuff play out um, is very interesting. And I, I, I think that more than potentially winning the nomination is why you would see somebody like Haley stay in this race, get a major keynote speech at the convention and try to keep the the, the neocon fire lit at least a little bit inside of the, the party. And not for nothing, most Republican elected officials in Congress are a lot closer to Nikki Haley than they are to Vivek Ramaswamy. I mean, by that's right. Lot. That's right. And even that, that they are to Trump. And Vivek's not a carbon copy of Trump. I mean, I've said a lot, uh, repeatedly, I think Vivek is trying to be a carbon copy of Tucker. 
I really fully believe he is, he watches Tucker and tries to say what Tucker says. Tucker's one of the most clever and gifted communicators that, that we have on the right side of the country. And Vivek is not somebody who's been in Republican politics at all. I, you know, I, I don't even think he was voting Republican or voting at all for most of his adult life. And it's like, we watched him enter the race. He was not woke. He made that his thing. So, okay. But he wasn't saying anything that was pro-Trump or pro-MAGA as, as recently as a couple of years ago. And then I really believe strongly he stumbled onto the Tucker message, listened to it, converted it, tried to make it his own. And for me personally, it's why he doesn't sound as persuasive as Tucker does, because it's not in his heart. He learned it and is repeating it, but it isn't his. It, like with Tucker, it's sincere. I know the guy. I know Vivek some too. So he's got some learning to do. He's got some committing it to heart, some like, I think, in order to really sell it as a politician. Because I think voters at some level, they know if you are if you mean it or if you're just parroting it. Uh, and I would say, if I were advising Vivek, that's your next step. You got, need to do more than learn it. You actually have to love it and live it and figure out how these guys who are a little older and a little wiser and have been doing it longer than you have got to where they got, right? Like what drove Tucker there? What as a guy who's who was the more National Review bow tie wearing Republican for most of his life, Tucker got there organically. That's the only way to really truly land there, Stu. Uh, so I do think Vivek has a future in politics if he wants it, but I would say he's got some work to do. Yeah, I think that's that's a really fair analysis. I, I think he, he does sometimes sound like he's speaking these things as, as his second language, um, though he is a talented communicator and a smart guy. I think he's learned a lot of these points really well. You can tell some of the books that he's read uh, and in, ingested and, you know, people kind of make fun of him as that chat GPT sort of candidate. But like you kind of get that from him where he has ingested a lot of material and he is really well spoken and has something to offer to conservative politics, especially if the if the Republican Party is going to be a MAGA party post Trump. Um, I, I don't think that's a, I, you know, look, you look at this as a Vivek Ramaswamy uh, campaign worker or maybe him himself. You have to look at this as a positive, right? I mean, you, no one really knew who you were. He wrote a couple of books about wokeness that were really good, and he had, you know, he had something to say before this, but no one knew who the guy was. He was, you know, invisible on the screen, on the scene. I kind of think of him, and this, a lot of people take this as a knock, but I don't mean it as a knock. I kind of think of him as the Pete Buttigieg of this campaign. We're like, look, Buttigieg kind of came out of nowhere. No one knew who he was. He had a little bit of a moment there where it seemed like, yeah, he was making a little bit of damage. He, is he the young, up and coming candidate? And then he winds up in some job inside the administration. It sort of feels like that might be the path for Ramaswamy. He has been oh undyingly God. loyal uh, to Donald Trump. I know, Trump. but like, to it, compare him to Pete Buttigieg is such an insult to poor Vivek. Oh, and he, Vivek, he as you know, is brilliant. He's so much smarter than that moron and tougher and Agreed. just more clever and capable and has made a gazillion dollars in the private sector, whereas Mayor Pete did absolutely nothing other than run a small town. Uh, I just, I get it. I, what you're saying is young whippersnapper whose name we didn't know. And then after mm -hmm. his presidential run, we did. But just, I'm sure you feel as I do about the intellectual comparison not holding up between those two well, men. We have no idea how Vivek Ramaswamy would uh, handle potholes in a small town. And no, it's we do true. know we that Pete can handle it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, <laughs> one point on each side, I think, Megan. I'm going to go ahead and say Vivek would not go on a two-month paternity leave either. But, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see. Um, his wife is still young. They could st still have more children. Time may tell. Uh, so Vivek will go on to become a powerful surrogate, I think, Dave, for probably Trump when Trump seals this thing up. And that'll give MAGA the chance to fall in love with him all over again when there's not like that natural divider between him and Trump in the end and the messaging and all that. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure about whether any of these candidates will actually be well positioned to run in 2028. You know, if Trump, let's say Trump wins, best case scenario for Republicans, who will be the favorites to run? It's usually somebody who is like then a rising star, right? It's like DeSantis won't be in office anymore. Nikki Haley won't be in office anymore unless they accept a Trump cabinet post, which, I mean, unless it's like an important cabinet post, it's not, not like Secretary of Transportation or HUD usually springboards you into the presidency. VP, that's another thing. But I don't think Trump's going to make any of these people his VP, do you? I don't know. Um, I, I, the only one I think that he might is Haley. Um, and oh my God, I'm not I think she's the least likely. 
I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not predicting that. Um, you know, people that I've talked to have, have suggested that this is on the table. I think you saw, you know, Nikki a, Haley's a people. Important... No, I mean, you saw, I think it was Jason Miller yesterday who was asked about Ramaswamy and had a hard no. He won't be the VP he was asked about Haley and did not have a hard no. Um, this may sound strange, uh, but part of the reason that I think that that Trump might go with Haley um, is to make all of his supporters who despise Haley uh, swallow that, uh, deal with it. That's a very Trumpy thing to do. It's kind of what mm -hmm. he did with Mike Pence. You have all these people online saying the base will revolt if it's Haley. No, they won't. What are they going to do? They're going to vote for Biden. They're going to stay home. They won't. They're going to do what Donald Trump tells them to do. So, but but no, I I I, I think he'll go someplace else. But I really liked what you said about um, Vivek and and you know sort of catching his own style. I mean, as when you're a young writer, you're always writing in the style of the people that you like, um, and and it's kind of obvious. And it takes a long time to incorporate all those things and find your own voice. Uh, I do think that he has a real shot of, of, of being able to do that and being a, a you know a, a compelling political voice in our country for for really I mean probably till after I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a fascinating thing. I missed that with Jason Miller, who's Trump's representative and very close with Trump. I think and, it was Jason you know, Miller. It was it was definitely one of them. I believe it was Jason, but but yeah, it was one of them. I mean, you know, Nikki Haley is loathed right now by many who are on Team Trump as sort of his opposite. And certainly Vivek's supporters hate her. But I I'm your point about it's very Trumpian appeals to me. You're you're right about that. I mean he does like to sort of stick a finger in your eye. Like I control MAGA and nobody other than yours truly controls MAGA and MAGA does what I tell them. I mean, that is how Trump mm -hmm. feels. So maybe you're right. This will be the ultimate test. He thinks he can get, because what he wants is to get back into the White House. That's what he wants more than yeah. anything. And if Nikki Haley could help him get there, then maybe. I mean, the first rule of picking the VP, Stu, is do no harm. That's the number one rule. I, yeah, that's that's very true. And that's why it seems like Ramaswamy wouldn't really be the right um, candidate. I mean, he's a very good communicator uh, and he almost seems like he'd be a really good press secretary. Not that he would take that role. Um, but, it, it, you know, as a vice president, he would be able to be a, a powerful advocate, uh, you know, a, a bulldog for Donald Trump. But, you know, and, and I will say some of his negatives, you know, if you know his occasional flourishes into strange 9-11 uh, conversations mm -hmm. wouldn't necessarily be dam as damaging to Trump as it would be to anyone else on Earth. Like Trump seems to be able to navigate those waters better than but better than anyone. But the thing about Haley, which I think is interesting, and I've been thinking about this the last couple of days, Haley, the one thing I would think Donald Trump thinks about most when he thinks about a vice presidential candidate is not the three years and 364 days of undying loyalty he got from Mike Pence, but the one day he feel, feels like he didn't get it from Mike Pence. And I can't imagine he's going to pick someone that he thinks in some big moment is going to pull out and say, no, Don, the Constitution is bigger than you or I. Now, just taking out how I feel about what Mike Pence did, which I believe he did the right thing, <laughs> Donald Trump does not. And I can't imagine he's going to pick someone who's a, a, a constitutional scholar type or an establishment Republican who really cares about traditions. I think he's going to want someone who's going to be able to bend to the Trumpian logic on some of these more controversial mm. moments. That's someone the he biggest can control. moment for him. Yeah. I you, think that's a very good control. point, too. I think it's going to be a woman. I think it's going to be a young woman. And I don't think it's going to be Haley. And I don't think it's going to be one of his competitors for what it's worth. Christy, no. I mean, Sounds like Christy Noem. Mm, I don't think it's going to be Christy Noem. Stefanik? I, I have You've got someone. Guess. Make it. I can yeah, tell. You have, I do. You have I do. Have I do have tell us. Here, tell us. Yeah, Megan. I don't do you, have, do you have any an reason to. to care, right? I no. <laughs> yes, it's me. Right. Trump and I, we, ah. we've come a long way. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> no, but I do have my suspicions. I'm not ready to say them yet, but I actually do. I have a woman in mind that I, I just think he's going to choose. And- mm -hmm. We'll see whether I'm right. I, I'll be honest with you. If he chooses somebody, if, if he picks a young woman and it's not mine, I'll tell you. And if it is mine, I've told my team, so they'll back me up on whether I have it right. Um, but I don't want to get ahead of my skis. Okay, so let's keep going because the, the media coverage is my favorite thing to talk about uh, on nights like this because they anything involving Trump 
any Republican really, but Trump especially brings out their true crazies. And that's my tease. We're gonna take a break and we come back. My God, do I have some delicious goodness for you gentlemen. You're gonna be so happy at these sound bites. Stand by. You've built this nation. You've weathered challenging times. You've witnessed moments of greatness. And now you may feel like you're watching it all fall apart. America deserves better. A fighting chance to become the great country it has always been. The Association of Mature American Citizens is America's leading conservative senior advocacy and benefits organization. It's your non-woke alternative to the AARP. With 2 million members strong, AMAC, as it's called, listens to its members and voices their concerns in Washington. They are here to offer you guidance, support, and address the issues that matter most in our communities. You can join AMAC today with memberships starting as low as $12 a year. Americans are recognizing that where they spend their dollar matters. Giving your hard-earned money to AARP further funds the decline of American values and promotes agendas that we the people do not support. Take action and visit amacamac.us slash Megan to choose the right plan for you. AMAC is more than just talk. AMAC gets things done. Visit amac.us slash Megan. That's Megan with a Y. Just a minute on some of the numbers, guys, before we get on to the media. Um, this, according to the New York Times, yeah, Trump won 51%, DeSantis won 21.2%, Nikki Haley came in at 19.1%, Vivek was down at seven. Uh, Vivek's out, Asa Hutchinson's out, DeSantis and Haley say they're moving forward. Trump won all, this is via Politico, Trump won all but one of Iowa's 99 counties. Amazing. Losing only, jo only Johnson County, home of the University of Iowa, to Nikki Haley by a single vote. Think about that. Just next time you think your vote doesn't matter. Uh, that one person who didn't like Trump and said, I'm voting Haley, you know, you were the one who cost him his perfect record on the counties there. Uh, he cleaned up across key GOP voting demographics, winning not just a majority of white evangelical Christians and non-college educated voters, but also a plurality of independents and college grads. Uh, the big controversy of the night, as you guys probably know, is the AP and, well, actually first it was CNN and then the AP and then CBS called the race for Trump 30 minutes into the voting, 30 minutes in, while people were still caucusing and therefore still voting. Now the call was correct. And the math they use, they do entrance polling where they say, who are you gonna vote for? And they merge that, they marry it up to actual vote that's coming in because some caucuses go quickly and they get actual vote and some go slowly. And those people didn't yet get counted when the AP and CNN and CBS called it. But anyway, the formula does work and it has worked for a long time, but I understand the consternation of the DeSantis team in particular that you shouldn't have announced that Trump won when people were still caucusing because especially for DeSantis and Haley, who came in second and by how much did matter. Right, Stu? I mean, I can get why it did matter. And, you know, the, the networks, they, they played a role last night that, you know, you don't want to see TV networks and press outlets playing. I can understand the uh, how you'd be upset over this if you were a Haley supporter or a DeSantis supporter. Uh, you know, you're in, I mean, I talked to people who were in Iowa. Go, they spent their time for months walking around to people's homes, knocking on doors, they show up as one of the caucus captains for Ron DeSantis. They're about to make their big speech and they get a text that says Donald Trump has won the caucus. I mean, that's, inc that's incredibly frustrating. And, you know, the way these networks, you know, Megan, they usually wait until the votes are are cast, right? Like they, they might close the polls and call it immediately because they believe their exit polling is good enough to be able to do that, which, you know, is, is fine if you get it right. But when people are still in the middle of voting, it's just not the right thing to do. The caucus runs in a strange fashion. It's not like a normal uh, primary or voting period where you know there's a time that all the voting stops and you can safely think that no one else is voting. It starts at, what was it, seven o'clock last night and people make speeches and they argue and they horse trade and they do all sorts of things. And it takes an hour, sometimes even longer. They really should give enough time for people to be able to cast their votes. So, you know, all this effort, all these millions of dollars that people pour into the state for this one night, why are you going to blow it up 20 minutes into it? It doesn't make mm -hmm. much sense. It doesn't do anything for anyone. Being a little earlier on a call where the race is 30 points, it, it, 
what does that do for the Associated Press? Nothing. And it makes people doubt the process just a little bit more. Mm-hmm. That's the thing, Davis, is like well, on primary night, they wouldn't like they wouldn't call the state of New York until all the polls in New York had closed, meaning, you know, that the voting is officially done. It's not counted, but it's done. So you're not affecting vote. The caucuses explains the AP in an article that's entitled Why AP Called Iowa for Trump, Race Call Explained, are different, they say. There are no, quote, polls and no fixed time when all the voting ends. So they just did their best to call it before the voting ended, which really, it is controversial. Again, it it wasn't wrong. Trump won, he won by a large margin, but I can see how it suppressed potential vote. Now, we don't know whether those people whose vote was still in the mix would have gone Trump, would have gone Haley, would have gone DeSantis, we don't know. But I can see if you're in a race toward a better percentage, how you'd be ticked off that there was like a thumb placed on the scale. I, I suppose. I, I don't think it makes any actual difference uh, in the real world. I, I mean, I, I can't. I speak to a lot of voters. I, I, I haven't met a lot of voters who I feel like would be sitting, would have made the trip to the caucus, be sitting there, know who they're going to vote for, get this text and either leave or say like, oh, well, now it's pointless. Um, look, maybe wait an hour. I think the AP has a point in that, like, how, do we have to wait until every single caucus is over? Do we have to wait until half of them? There's probably some middle ground to find here, like maybe wait an hour and after the caucus is open or something. Um, but listen, it's a it's a poor musician who blames their instrument. It's a poor politician who blames the media. It, it, it's not a winning argument. Um, I thought Haley was kind of smart to just ignore it uh, and and let it go. And I, I don't think it sways voters. I I, I mean, I, I I don't know. I think this is a quick fix. I, I, I don't think it's that that big of a story. Um, but, you know, when you have a tough night, you, you, you grasp onto whatever you can, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, Trump was not complaining. And, uh, you know, he, he has complained in the past when he lost to um, Ted Cruz in 16. He, he claimed that vote was not trustworthy and that he, in fact, won. Even though Trump went on to win the nomination, he's still trying to relitigate that. Um, but I will tell you this, the networks never change. They, uh, during Trump's victory speech, decided to cut away. He's too controversial to listen to because you see, he lies, he lies. And that is why Rachel Maddow's MSNBC cannot tolerate his victory speech. Here's how she explained it in SOT 10. There is a reason that we and other news organizations have generally stopped giving an unfiltered live platform to remarks by former President Trump. It is not out of spite. It is not a decision that we relish. It is a decision that we regularly revisit. Um, And honestly, earnestly, it is not an easy decision. But there is a cost to us as a news organization of knowingly broadcasting untrue things. Is there really? I take you to some examples of Rachel Maddow's untrue things over the past few years. Watch. Now we know that the vaccines work well enough that the virus stops with every vaccinated person. Well, if they were going to look at potential tax evasion, what would they need to look at in order to look for potential tax evasion? Hmm. What I have here uh, is a copy of Donald Trump's tax returns. He paid uh, $38 million, looks like $38 million in taxes. So ahead of that meeting, they knew it was the Russian government. Ahead of that meeting, the president's son, according to this new reporting, was informed, hey, the Russian government has dirt on Hillary Clinton. And apparently the response to that was, Russian, 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 Russia, Russian, 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 I, I like I like Rachel Maddow's untrue things as the new name of her show. I think that would <laughs> flow really nicely and would catch on quickly. Um, I object to the fact that she never changes her clothing. Yeah, she is wearing pretty much the same outfit. Uh, it's every a uniform, night. and it's not yeah. a good enough outfit to use as your everyday standby. <laughs> as a guy who wears the same suit every single night, I, I can't complain. <laughs> um, but I, I, I will say that, like, it's interesting to watch th- th- this happen with the media. They're so sure 
that not allowing Trump to communicate with voters is a good idea. And if the goal is to stop Trump, sometimes maybe the opposite should be true. I mean, I think we talked about the softening of Republican voters from January 6th on through this primary. Part of that is I think absence kind of grow makes the heart grow fonder. Time heals mm -hmm. all wounds, right? I, I think the fact that he was it not in everyone's all face. Heals. Yeah, it does do that as well. Um, it, it's one of those things where if, if he was on Twitter every single day like he used to be, you know, he if everyone was on Truth Social and seeing the things that he said, I, look, the guy came out and said he was going to suspend the Constitution. It was that big of a deal, the 2020 election. That made me cringe like nobody's business. But most people who like Donald Trump didn't even know he said mm -hmm. stuff that Ron DeSantis tried to bring up as counter arguments were things that Trump had said and people weren't even aware of them. I don't know that that would have changed the election. I think Trump is in a very unique position. But when it comes to a general election, I do think we're in a different position. Trump is probably helped by the fact that it looks like, number one, everyone's trying to take him off the ballot, trying to throw him in prison, trying Definitely. to silence him. You know, Not I, I mean, this is what unites people Definitely. around him. They don't learn. They don't get it. They'll just, like today, this morning, Trump today, um, Dave, is he's all right off of his victory not going on the campaign trail immediately. He's going to New York. He's where you are, steps from where I am, to attend the E. Jean Carroll defamation damages trial. She won a defamation judgment against him, and then he doubled down and said the same stuff about her being a kook. And she said, hey, same sin, more money. And now the judge is trying to determine how much more money Trump is going to have to pay E. Jean Carroll, if any. So he decides, uh, clearly he doesn't need to be there. This is civil. He doesn't have to be there. He, he's, he's chosen to call attention to it. Trump understands that him being battered around by the legal system is a very good thing for his electoral prospects. CNN, MSNBC do not understand that. This, just this morning on CNN, they had the whole panel of exer experts, they had David Axelrod, they had them all sitting around like, I don't understand. Like this, uh, he's, uh, he's so dumb. Like he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. That's not what he should be calling attention to. They don't understand he gets it better than they do. Yeah, I mean, how stupid does Rachel Maddow have to think her audience is to believe that if she allows them to even watch a speech by Donald Trump, they're going to be so mystified by, you know, his lying rhetoric that they're going to become pro-MAGA. I mean, it, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. I was talking to, to a buddy of mine who uh, writes it, not, I wouldn't call it a liberal outlet, but, but a sort of down the line outlet about this very question. And he said to me, well, isn't it possible, David, that, that the way Trump lies is different than what we're used to from normal politicians? And this is why we feel like we have to take extra measures. And I said, well, maybe. But wait a minute, because Joe Biden told me that he had never spoken about business with Hunter Biden. Right. Um, Jen Psaki assured me that when artist Hunter Biden was going to be selling these paintings, that there was some really firm ethical standard. But I mean, that was just a blatant lie. Right. Yeah. She refused to answer how many cases of covid we had in the White House and whether there were breakthrough cases. I mean, these politicians lie to us all the time. Trump may do it in in, in a somewhat different way, but you're right. He, he's out there. I mean, look at the difference between how Donald Trump is handling his legal woes, literally making speeches every day, insisting that he is innocent at the courthouses and the way that Joe Biden is dealing with his impeachment and his legal situation. Oh, I can't talk about that. It's an ongoing investigation. I'm sure that Trump's lawyers would love him to just shut up about all this stuff, but he's not going to do it. And, and that is a huge part of his appeal. And no one has figured out, you know, maybe don't, instead of just second guessing him, maybe ask yourself another question about whether you're the ones who don't understand the strategy because Trump is laughing all the way to the presidency. That's the thing. Like, you, okay, I mean, it might be time for you over at MSNBC and CNN to reevaluate your media tactics, which are, yes, of course, securing the nomination for him, but from the way this looks, is gonna go right down to securing the presidency for the man. They don't get it, Stu. They still think they know better. That is their way. This is what they believe about every single topic, including your health care and uh, how much of your money you should be giving them. This is the policy <laughs> that they continually follow. And I, I agree with you. They, they don't understand that this is the reason why uh, he is has such a lock over 
Republican voters right now. Now, look, there's an argument to be made that they kind of like this right now, right? They, they, they know how to fight Donald Trump. They believe they can beat him again. They might believe he's the only candidate on the right that they can actually beat. And I, I do think that there's something to that belief on their side. That's what they think can happen. It's a risky proposition, but it seems to be the one they're entering into. Whether that actually works, I mean, the polling's not showing it. I mean, look, does Nikki Haley poll a little bit better in the general election most of the time? Yeah, I guess. But there's but no not, chance of her getting to the general election. But, but not but, that much. Not by that much. There's one poll that showed her like considerably higher than Trump against Biden. But most of them show it just by a couple points. Stand by. Uh, we're going to pick it up in one minute. Squeeze in a quick break. True or false? Using your tax refund to pay off credit card debt is smart. False. Well, donewithdebt.com published a strategy designed to let you keep your hard-earned tax refund and reduce or eliminate credit card debt. Most Americans owe thousands in credit card debt that will take years to pay off, if at all. Done with debt found that filing bankruptcy is usually not the answer, and taking out loans to pay off credit cards usually increases debt. When you engage done with debt, their legal experts and skilled negotiators will take on the credit card companies for you. Their winning strategies are designed with one goal, solve your debt situation quickly and permanently. First things first, chat with a done with debt strategist and explore your possible solutions. That Just that will make you feel better. Some debt fighting strategies though are time sensitive, so you do need to move quickly. Call right away. Check it out now. For a free consultation, visit done. D-O-N-E, with debt, D-E-B-T, dot com. Done with debt, dot com. The Democrats and the left-wing press's obsession with race and their knee-jerk reaction to insert it into any story, including election results, was on full display last night. I start with, of course, the worst culprit, who is Joy Reid. Got a couple of examples, but we'll start with SOT6. The important sort of data point that this is a state that is overrepresented overrepresented by white Christians that are going to participate in these tonight. caucuses, yes. especially tonight. Um, I today earlier today reached out to Robert Jones, Robbie Jones um, from the Public Religion Research Institute, knowing that we were going to talk about Iowa. And this is a hyper evangelical st white state. And he said the following to me. Iowa is about 61 percent white Christian. The country as a whole is approximately 41 percent white Christian. And in Iowa, we're talking about evangelical white Christians. Because I asked him, they, what do they get out of supporting Donald Trump? Because he keeps losing, he keeps delivering losses and losses and losses. And he said the following, they see themselves as the rightful inheritors of this country. And Trump has promised to give it yeah. back to them. All the things that we think about, about electability, about, you know, what are people gaming out or mm -hmm. none of that matters when you believe that God has given you this country, that it is yours and that everyone who is not a white conservative Christian is a is a fraudulent American, is a less, a less, a less real American, then you don't care about electability. Got it, Dave. It's the whiteies and their sense of entitlement that explains Trump's rise in the polls, the problematic whites who have a sense of entitlement. I, I'd like to think that that news alert was like somebody in the booth who was like, can we <laughs> shut this woman up? I think, <laughs> is there anything, like, is there any news Guaranteed. that we can break with? Just yeah, just stop it. Um, you know, Eagles down by 10, you know, whatever. Um, sorry, Stu, it's sorry to me too. It um, no, I, look, it's, it's it, aside from being itself, racist uh, aside from just being utterly and completely inaccurate in, in in terms of the way that white voters you know who many of whom voted for obama right i mean we know that this is that this is abject foolishness it's also just gotten enormously boring i i, I mean it's just the same thing over and over and over uh, with no new results. And and I guess that the idiots who watch MSNBC who aren't smart enough to watch a Donald Trump speech without suddenly turning into, you know, red-hatted MAGA people enjoy hearing Joy Reid say these things. But I think it's telling that that clip is on your show rather than on Joe Biden's ex account, because I, I don't I don't know who rhetoric like that possibly helps. It's it's so divisive. It's so wrong. Mm. That's that's the business she's in. Uh, I she doubled down 
because you see in, in Joy Reid's view, Nikki Haley didn't come in third in Iowa because her message didn't resonate with a state full of voters who lean more conservative. It's because she's got brown skin and the hateful Republicans, it's a hard no to somebody with her background. Take a listen to SOT7. It, it's the elephant in the room. She's still a brown lady that's got to try oh, to win boy. in a party oh. that is deeply anti-immigrant and which accepts the notion that you can say immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country. She's getting, you know, birthered by Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis's only argument for staying in it is he's the white guy that he can still make the appeal to white people. While we have Can you imagine looking at the world like this? This woman has a primetime show on MSNBC. This is a deep psychosis, I believe. It is something that is strange, and I don't understand it. I, I will tell you, I've never met anyone in my entire life who's a white person who thinks they are the rightful inheritors of this country. They believe in the fundamental principles of this country, the founding principles of this country, and they want to protect those. That's a cultural argument. That is a, 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 an argument of institutions. That is not an argument of color of skin. Uh, you know, I think... I live by this rule. I try to live by this rule. I encourage everyone to live by this rule. I think most people do, which is never, ever in your entire life make a decision, any decision based on skin color for any reason. That's a really simple, simple rule that I think most Americans strive to follow. It's not always perfect. Certainly, there are people who make decisions based on skin color. There probably are people who are like she describes. I guess they exist. Never met one, but maybe they do. Uh, maybe those are the people with the tiki torches back in Charlottesville. I don't know. It's but Joy Reid. It, it it is. It is. She the there is a thirst for this racism to exist. There is a lust for it to exist. There is a lust for it to explain all bad things so they can justify uh, all of their own mistakes and 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 losses and disappointments in life. And you know, this comes from the left. I mean, you know, look, talk to conservative people of color. They don't think this way. Talk to people uh, all around the country of all different colors and sizes and everything else. People want to see others based on merit. That's what that's what the country's foundation is, merit. And instead, they're trying to turn this into a place where we're bringing back decision-making based on skin color. I thought we all agreed that was a bad time. That was the wrong way to go. I thought we all agreed on that. And for some reason, they're trying to drag it back into modern times. Uh, leave it back 100, 200, 300 years ago. You know, Trump has, he said the thing about immigrants are poisoning the blood. And the, there's a real question about whether some of the immigrants coming across our Southern border are, we know they are, bringing fentanyl into this country and literally poisoning the blood, literally being responsible for poisoning the blood of Americans to the tune of 100,000 deaths a year. Uh, this has been something Trump's been raging about for a while, but in the eyes of every MSNBC host, it's just one drop of immigrant blood makes you unacceptable to Republicans. That's where they've gone with it. One drop of immigrant blood makes you a hard no for the racist GOP. Her colleague over on MSNBC, Lawrence O'Donnell, took it there as well. It wasn't a one-off. Listen to him. CBS poll, uh, their final poll before the Iowa caucus, this is a national poll, shows that 81% of Republican primary voters and caucus participants, 81% of those people agree with Donald Trump that immigrants are poisoning the blood of this country. That means that 81% of the Republican primary electorate believe Nikki Haley has poisoned blood and is poisoning the blood of the United States. I, like, I can't. But his fake Man is literally sanctimony. married to an immigrant. Yeah, he's <laughs> literally married to an immigrant. Right, good well, point. This is so absurd. I guess it's like Barron's, Barron's blood is poisoned under this lo this rationale, this logic. No, I mean, they. I, his fake sanctimony and gravitas, his attempt to tell you that 81% believe this. They're like, it's amazing to me that they have even two viewers left. This is the only thing that they that they traffic in this. And all bad news for Trump is bad and all good news for Trump is bad. 
that brings me to my next, my next point over on MSNBC. They, so you wonder with Trump getting, because they'd been saying for weeks in advance of Iowa, like he's got to get over 50%. He, anything less than 50% is a loss for Trump. Um, well, he did it. He got over 51%. So no, was MSNBC going to say, you know what? He did it. He's stronger than ever. I get it. Whatever. That's what the, no. That too is a bad sign for Trump. Um, an ominous sign, in fact, Dave Marcus. Take a listen to this montage we put together uh, of that reaction. If Barack Obama took four years off and then ran in a Democratic caucus in Iowa, would 50% of Democrats vote against Barack Obama? We can all sit here and, and you know, put on sackcloth and ashes and, and, and moan about Donald Trump getting 51% of the vote. Got to say, for people who actually want to win general elections, that's not good news. 50% of people voting in the Iowa caucuses against a former president uh, is bad news for that party's prospects in the general election. Not good news. Almost half of the base of the Republican Party showing up for this caucus tonight voted against Donald Trump. Think about that. First of all, 50-50 for an incumbent really sucks. Um, this is not good for Donald Trump. Have they seen the approval ratings on Joe Biden, Dave? Have they seen the number of Democrats who do not want Joe Biden to be the nominee and would happily rush to the polls if the Democratic Party would allow a real challenger? Oh, I, I'll, I'll do you one better than that, Megan. And, and, you know, bookmark all of those segments for a week from now. I just looked at a poll that shows Dean Phillips at 28 percent in New Hampshire. Now, most viewers are saying, who is Dean Phillips, as I was about two weeks ago. He's at 28 percent. Joe Biden is, is is at about 50 to 55 percent in these New Hampshire polls. Now, the Democrats pulled a fast one, right? They said, oh, these votes won't count. We're not even putting Joe Biden on the ballot. But I'm under no obligation to 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 buy into that fast one and say I'm not going to pay any attention to this. The fact of the matter is, Joe Biden is is at about the same place in New Hampshire as the actual incumbent president, as what <laughs> Donald Trump performed at yesterday in Iowa. Now, all these clowns on MSNBC, if if if, if you know Phillips gets 30 percent of the vote, are they going to have the same reaction? Of course, they're of course they aren't. I mean, whatever Donald Trump does is bad. It's bad for the country. It's bad for Trump. It's bad for everybody except MSNBC you know, thinks it's it's ratings, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, I, I, of course, you're right. I mean, they, they said he's got to hit 50 percent. Oh, he did. Uh, and that was it. Right. Yeah, it, it's it's the thing is, too, it's um, he needed to hit a higher bar, even though the first time around in 16, he, I think he won Iowa with 26 percent, went on to secure the nomination. The Republican he Party lost. at, at he, large he, hated him, hated him. Right. He lost. But he, he hit, I think, 26 percent. Uh, yeah. The Republican Party hated him, went on to vote for him, as I said before, 90 percent over came home for Trump. If they don't think the party's going to come home against Joe Biden, they haven't been paying attention. And not just the party, but there are a fair amount of Democrats and independents, in particular Democrats, who weren't allowed to vote in Iowa last night, who are also going to cross party lines to vote for Donald Trump this time because of their wallets. Yeah, you know, and that is the key to this election, I think, for Donald Trump, if he is the nom nominee, which it looks like he will be. There is a part of this, and this is what the left is hanging their hats on, that Donald Trump will come back in, he'll say all these things, people will be reminded about the things they didn't like about him. This will become a referendum on Donald Trump instead of a referendum on Joe Biden, and that's the path to victory for Joe Biden. It's, a, again, a really risky strategy. But if this happens to be a referendum on Joe Biden, he doesn't have a chance. Right. I mean, this has been a catastrophe. This has been, you know, four years coming up on four years of disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. The border is in worse shape than it's ever been. Uh, we, we just went through a high inflationary period. Now the point that they're bragging that it's come down to just slightly elevated percentages. We have what's going on in Ukraine, what happened in Afghanistan, all of these situations going on at the same time. He's mismanaged each and every one of them to one degree or another. And in normal times, this would not be difficult. This would, the American people would be able to say, okay, this has been a, a bad four years. 
Let's go back to the guy with low inflation and when everyone had jobs and the, the economy was roaring. And sure, we had our problems, but they seem minor in comparison to what we have now. Donald Trump does have a unique ability to wrest the news cycle away from those types of thoughts. And that is what the media, <laughs> I think, is planning on trying to accomplish once we get past this primary period. Uh, we will see if that's successful. But what a risk. What a risk, Megan, for someone that they claim is literally Hitler, right? If they, if if that's who they think this guy is, the, the very last thing they should be doing is acting like this and empowering him through this primary and probably winning over people who are just looking at this and saying, it's just unfair what they're doing to this guy. I care about democracy. I do. You keep saying we should care about democracy. Then don't take the other option off the ballot. Don't throw the other guy in prison. People are reacting really negatively to this, and it may wind up burning them in a huge way. Yeah, that was the line of the day. Very funny. Uh, here's a little bit more of them trying to drive home to, I guess, the two open-minded MSNBC watchers on why Trump is so bad and you could not possibly consider him over the very, very good Joe Biden. Listen to SOT 12. With Joe Biden, you've got a guy who grew up in a family whose dad struggled. As he got older, uh, Joe Biden went through uh, one tragedy after another. He lost a wife and a baby girl in a tragic car accident. Uh, he lost a son to cancer. Uh, his other son struggles with addiction. Uh, and through it all, you have Joe Biden persevering. And on the other side, He's running against a guy who right now is trashing American democracy. He's a draft dodger. His daddy gave him $400 million. He inherited $400 million, which he lost. A New York judge says he's a rapist. He's been caught stealing nuclear secrets. So it's interesting. Um, I was there in 2015 and 16 when Trump ran the first time. He had already, quote, dodged the draft. He was already born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He had already been given 400 million bucks by his dad. And this is Joe Scarborough and Morning Joe back then. And he's gonna offer you the vice presidential nomination. Will you accept it? I'll do anything uh, that will we'll get, um, will stop us from eight more years like the, the, the past eight years we've had. Okay. Do you don't want me to do um, the ones with the, um, Deportation. Nothing, nothing too hard, Mika. Okay. It's a family affair. They say you can tell a lot about a person by their children. Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump join their father here on set. Your three children uh, that, that, I mean, everybody talks about uh, how they're hard workers. Is Donald Trump a summer flame? No, I suspect maybe he's going to be an autumn affair as well as a summer <laughs> flame. And you know it's my hair. Well, I do because I, I tugged on it once. Mika, what do you mean pretty good? You know you loved it. <laughs> wow. Trump, you're naughty. Scarborough literally saying he would be Trump's VP. Same guy. Did... Did the draft thing happen in between 15 and 23? Because I don't I don't remember that. Yeah, no, it, it didn't. Can, can I just say that I've always felt so bad for Joe Biden's dad. I mean, every time you hear about Joe Biden's dad, like he's worried about money. It's like you're hearing some <laughs> conversation from the bedroom. Like, I don't know if we're going to make the rent, sweetie. I'm, I'm really worried. I mean, it's like every story about Joe Biden's dad, this this poor guy. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm glad finally that it worked out for the family. But no, I mean, look, it, it, it's ridiculous. The, I, I, Stu brought up the people who held their nose to vote for Trump in 2016. I didn't. I, I, I was very worried about Trump. I didn't know what the hell this guy was going to do. And I did not vote for, for Donald Trump in 2016. It took me about a year to realize that like the sky wasn't falling. Uh, the bunch of stuff was happening that like I kind of liked. And I said, okay, I was wrong about this. This is fine. These guys somehow went the complete opposite direction where they started off at, you know, oh, don't worry. Like we've known him for a while. It'll be fine. Went through four years of outside of Democrats in Congress going insane, four years of relative normalcy. And now their hair is on fire. You're right. It, but that makes absolutely no sense. That's what a lot of people believe did it, that Trump did not select Joe Scarborough mm -hmm. as his VP. 
And oh. many people say that was the beginning of the turn where suddenly Trump didn't look all shiny and fun anymore. And they were getting all sorts of blowback Scarborough, from people. Do you think Scarborough would have done what Trump asked him to do uh, at the at the Capitol? No, I don't. No? I don't. Mm -mm. No, I wouldn't impugn Scarborough that way. I really think you'd yeah. have to be a complete Trump lackey uh, to have done what he asked, which was totally inappropriate. And I think Mike yeah. Pence did his duty and was a hero that day. And I don't really Agreed. care if people disagree with me at all. That's my firm belief. However, I also think like the obsession with the left on trying to tell us that that election was perfect, Stu, is ridiculous. I do think that Joe Biden won the election, but there were so many issues with the way the election was handled that I completely understand the majority belief on the Republican side that the election was, quote, stolen, right? I don't agree that the, that there were, I don't agree with the votes being flipped from the one to the other, but, you know, we could go over the media bias that happened, the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop uh, story, the 50 intelligence so-called experts who came out to say it was disinformation, the Chris Wallace stopping any debate about Joe Biden's corruption and Hunter's connections to Ukraine at that debate. We could keep going. Um, the changing of the rules in Pennsylvania, the COVID uh, mail-in ballot changes without the proper approvals. You know, there were a lot of irregularities that left people with a very sour taste in their mouths. And I get that and I validate all of that. But to me, the Democrats' refusal to acknowledge, like I can say, okay, no evidence of votes being flipped, but also rigged might be an appropriate term. I get why Republicans feel that way. The left cannot do that. The left is not un totally unwilling to look at how the election went down and whether Republicans might have a point in feeling like it, it was stolen, however you want to interpret that word. I, that brings me to John King. So we go from MS over to CNN. I was watching CNN for a bit last night and John King, I mean, literally every time they went to the guy, he's doing the board, you know, like here's this county, here's that county. Blah, blah, blah. Every time they went to the man, he made a comment about how this is how elections play out. It's beautiful. It's America. It's legitimate. You just watch it with your eyes. It makes me so happy. It's very unfortunate these Republicans think it was stolen. It's very, it's not true. It's not true. They were talking about the exit polls showing um, did, Bi did Biden win legitimately in 2020 for Iowa Republican caucus voters were, voters were asked, did he win legitimately? Now, legitimately is an ambiguous term. Back to the discussion mm -hmm. I just raised. Uh, 65% of Republicans voters said no. 30% said yes. I totally get that. I, I get that. Legitimately speaks to the points I was making. Um, take a listen to John King having a repeated meltdown over that number. So many of these people about to vote in Iowa believe the election was stolen when it simply was not. That is one of the biggest changes Donald Trump has had on the Republican Party. The distrust in American politics, in the process, in, in the legitimacy of the process is a cancer on American democracy. And so as Republicans <laughs> watch this tonight, tonight, set aside anyone who tells you, yeah, but we do it right and the Democrats do it differently. Or if it's in a blue city or a blue state, they do it differently. It's just not true, historically, when so many people <laughs> have been told to doubt the integrity of elections, right? This, to me, as someone who's done this for 40 years, forgive me for editorializing, is the saddest part of our democracy that people doubt this. I love watching this because it's working the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> and that could have, I mean, could have kept that going for another 20 minutes still. Uh, it's priceless. Uh, you know, look, we we want trust in the system. It's funny that the the the, the the side of the aisle that keeps talking about trust in the system is like, you know, we really need that democracy, the kind with only one name on the ballot. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, it's like I it's a totally bizarre sort of circumstance where they keep going down this road and, and making these arguments where they don't think they hear themselves speak. And by the way, this is very, very natural. Like parties say these things all the time in polls because they don't like the other side. It's really, it boils down to that at some level. The number yesterday in Iowa was 65, 66% of people who did not think Biden was uh, legitimately elected. But if you go back to the early Trump years, the, the Democrats were polling in the mid seventies is, was Donald Trump a legitimately elected president? They were saying the answer to that was no because of it's Russia so gate or whatever Rachel Maddow was saying on her new untrue things program. Um, so 
you, this is very much like the same thing happened with, you know, birthers and all these claims that kind of bu bubble up on each side. A lot of it reflects, look, I just don't like that guy. I remember talking to a few people back right after the 2020 election and and they were very convinced that the election had had been stolen. And I was just pressing on them, trying to understand what they meant, because I think Republicans, to your point, Megan, would have done a be should have done a better job parsing the differences you just talked about. I think a lot of times people were too hesitant to say, well, wait a minute, you know, some of these claims on the Internet are not true. But here's what is true. People were getting mailed ballots and we don't know what happened. Uh, rules were changed in ways that did seem unconstitutional preceding the elections. Things that Donald Trump and his campaign should have challenged before the votes were were counted. All of that is is really true. But I was talking to a few of these people and they were just like, I'm sure of it. It had to be elected. We kept going down road after road after road until they basically told me there's just no way America would elect that guy. There's mm -hmm. no way after seeing Joe so Biden yeah, stumble around on stage and not know seemingly anything about anything and not be able to get through a complete sentence. Uh, it, there's no way that guy could have received this many votes. A very rational, rational thought. I mean, I don't know that I would have believed it either. Uh, there's a big difference, though, into what you were talking about and, you know, votes being uh, switched uh, at the ballot box. And I think that, look, it would be fascinating to, to be able to rewind and see when you saw polling back in the George W. Bush era, where, you know, 50 and 60 percent of people believed 9-11 was an inside job orchestrated by uh, by George W. Bush on the Democratic side. Can these can these theories do go through parties, largely they are a reflection of partisanship, though, not the falling of all democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I to me, mm. Trump is a master messenger and he lost, he was upset he lost, he doesn't believe he lost. And he has spent the past four years trying to convince his base and the Republican party that it isn't true. The same way, you know, the Ukrainian phone call was a perfect phone. It wasn't like just an okay, phone call that didn't deserve impeachment. It was perfect. And everything he's done is perfect. You know, like he's he's a master messenger and he really can. He's very good at just repeating the same thing over and over and over. And he's definitely convinced large portions of the Republican Party that it was stolen in the way that I don't believe. And they're entitled to their belief. I don't really care. I don't need to convince them out of that. This is what my belief is. But I think, you know, his just consternation over the fact that they were like, he he went with stolen. They said not legitimate in their in their exit polling is very amusing to me. Just fucking move on. Like move on. We got to shore up the voting system. It's okay to kick the tires and make sure that it's better than it was the last time around. And by the way, not for nothing, but not, not all the states vote the way Iowa does, which was kind of a beautiful thing to watch. I, I loved seeing... I just write Trump on the back of my paper and I give it to you. And then you count, there are 40 people in this room. Do I have 40 ballots here? Here's some for Trump. Here's from, for, for some for DeSantis. You put it in a basket and you sit, head, hand it to the head guy saying, here's our count. That's what we grew up with. That is that is sort of legitimate and familiar to people. It's this other stuff, mail in, the you know somebody shows up at your house, takes your ballot from you, you know dead people voting. That's what gets people upset. All right, different story. All right, I've got to turn the page because the the greatest story of the day we haven't even touched on, and that is our sitting vice president. She's so smart. She's so clever. She's so good at figuring things out. Like one of the things she figured out at a campaign event on Monday is how amazing Gen Z is. You know, they take a lot of a lot of guff from us Gen Xers and those in between. Uh, she loves Gen Z and she wants you to as well. And here's why, SOT17. I see our college students up there. <laughs> and let me just tell you, I love Gen Z. I don't know if it's up, you know, I love Gen Z. <laughs> so, okay, for the older adults, this is going to be a humbling thing I'm about to share with you. If someone is 18 years old today, they were born in 2005. <laughs> oh, yeah, check that out. What? Think about that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we use calculators? Sorry. Megan? Yeah. No, no, no. I thought about it. it, it the math is correct. Yes. Oh. I'm still checking. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Uh, she's a, she is hilarious. What? What That's a strange figure. 
in our in our yeah. politics. What a strange figure. So that, like her attempted profundities always get to me. I love them. That one, she was, oh, this is going to blow your mind. <laughs> it's going to blow your mind. But she actually took a shot uh, at being a little bit more profound uh, in celebration of MLK uh, at her at this event in Columbia, South Carolina. And she busted out like her favorite line. It's the most absurd. She says it all the time. You would think her speech writers would say, Madam, you've said that too many times. Nobody knows what the F you're talking about. But she keeps saying it over and over in SOT 16, listen for yourself. Today, we celebrate the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a visionary who saw what could be unburdened oh God. by what had been. Oh, no. Ah, oh, cringe, cringe. I'll just take you back, just and then I'll give it to you guys, but just take a listen. We just put together a quick one, SOT 27, example. I can imagine what can be and be unburdened by what has been, you know? What oh can God. be unburdened by what has been? What can be unburdened by what has been? What can be unburdened by what has been? <laughs> what can be unburdened by what has been what we can see what we believe can be unburdened by what has been what can be unburdened by what has been what can be unburdened by what has been is she done the <laughs> rnc actually put that together is she done i can't like there's nothing in it. she's an empty vessel she is an empty mm -hmm. vessel she has no profundities to offer, and it's very clear to all of us, and she could very well be our next president if Joe Biden gets reelected. Stu? Look, I, I, I don't know if that's fair. I, I really see her more as uh, uh, she's seeing what can be and is unburdened by what has been, Megan. And I think that's <laughs> really the deep. It's fascinating to watch her. Uh, she's unburdened by by everything except the mask that she's wearing in the last clip, which is fascinating she's to watch. Unburdened by intelligence. Yes, unburdened by intelligence. A shame, embarrassment. I mean, the only thing she said more than than the unburdened line is her love for yellow school buses and electric and school the Venn buses. Diagram. She does, and the Venn diagram. Those there, like there's three things she says. <laughs> she's got three tracks on the CD, and she's hitting random at every speech. It is a bizarre thing. And I, you know, she, I love that, particularly the first clip in that montage where she just has this like unburdened by what it's been. You know, she has right. that like, I, it's just so simple. And like, can you believe I came up with it? She is a, a, a strange figure. And oddly enough, really nobody's won over by it. I, I don't know how she yes. has this job. She was a complete failure in the primary. She has unlike ability uh, ratings that are, you know, that borderline like dead fish on the sidewalk. Nobody seems to like uh, Kamala Harris at all. And, you know, you're right. She probably would be very difficult to avoid if if for some reason they made a change or she was going to run in the, the next time, because how do you how do you change and avoid the person of color that is uh, your VP? But man, I don't even think, you know, Democrats don't even like her. Nobody defends her. She's just seemingly a-, a Well, but Joe Biden, uh, she, I mean, she is a burden the odds of him making it five more years. That, that was my point is simply, the odds of him making it five more years if he gets reelected are very slim based on Low. the way he's performing right now. So she would take over. I don't, I don't think anybody would actually voluntarily elect her as president, but she could get in there if that happens. She, the, the, the problem with Kamala Harris, many, many, many problems. She really is unburdened by a high IQ, Dave. It's obvious to anybody who watches her for two minutes. But not only is she, does she not appear to be very sharp, she, she's a race provocateur. She's Joy Reid in a different suit. And we see it regularly. Now, the, the one group that Joe Biden continues to perform well with and that the Democrats are extremely dependent on for votes are black women. He's losing black men to Trump, like overwhelmingly now in the latest polls in a way we've never seen before. We'll see whether that holds on the actual election day. But Trump's doing better with black men than any Republican ever has. And Biden's hemorrhaging them, but not black women. And so he cannot eject the black woman who has been on the ticket with him in any way that would work and maintain his presidency or, you know, get reelected. 
So of course not. One as, of the things. As, as, she, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, as Fanny Willis uh, explained to us, we can't expect black women to be perfect, right? Right, right. I, That's I mean, the it's, standard. It's, it's, it's exactly the, it's exactly the same thing. So so no, she she can't be abandoned for for that very reason, of course. Um, so, but the other thing she, she does saying, is she pokes the racial bear all the time. Mm-hmm. You can take it to the bank. She remember after those Tennessee lawmakers went out onto the floor and threw their fit because they weren't getting the exact debate they wanted. She went down there to hail them as heroes after Jacob Blake um, tried, he pulled a knife on cops and got sh- shot. She went out there at his hospital bed after he had abused police officers, resisted arrest and assaulted them, calling him a hero. She weighed in and retweeted the, you know, help support the BLM people who were arrested after the riots. A- anytime there's a racial dispute, she's the first to stoke the fires. And that brings me to what she did at, in Columbia, South Carolina on this Martin Luther King Day speech she gave where she had the nerve to bring up the following example when she's talking about some of the racial strife in the history of America. Listen to what she adds on in SOT 15. Generation after generation, on the fields of Gettysburg, in the schools of Little Rock, on the grounds of this state house, on the streets of Ferguson, and on the floor of the Tennessee House of Representatives, we the people have always fought to make the promise of freedom real. Streets of Ferguson, Dave. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly disrespectful to the soldiers who lost their lives at, at Gettysburg and, and, and throughout the Civil War, but nobody cares about that, right? I mean, th- that doesn't matter. That, that, that wasn't a debt paid. That, that, that was apparently something else. Um, this is part of what makes her rhetoric about unburdening ourselves from the past uh, not only deeply stupid, but really menacing and dangerous. Because what she means by that is tearing down statues. What she means by that is rewriting history. What she means by that is abandoning everything that America has ever stood for and ignoring that in the hopes of some pie in the sky equity that nobody can even actually explain or, or you know, tell us how it would work. And you know that's dangerous. I it, it, with all the political news, it went a little bit under the radar. But you know, last week or the week before, uh, I, I was heartened by the fact that when the Biden administration tried to take down that William Penn statue, there was so much blowback yeah. that the Democrat governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, called the administration and said, "Hey, you can't do that." Right? No chance in hell that would have happened in 2020. Absolutely none. That statue would have been gone the next day. I so, remember you at the Natural well, History Museum. I, I absolutely was. And I'm I, I'm still sad that that statue isn't there. I mean, New Yorkers hey, love that statue. No, nobody asked them. Th- there was no referendum. And, and nobody was offended by the Teddy Roosevelt statue, except for some lefty idiots on some committee somewhere. So, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And and Kamala Harris really is, uh, you know, the, the, the platonic ideal uh, of all this nonsense, and if she had our, if she had her druthers, she would unburden us from the past. We would, we would know nothing about the actual past of the United States. That is her goal. It's amazing that she has the nerve to bring up Ferguson. In the same breath, I mean, it, fifty thousand people died at Gettysburg, but okay, it's the same thing. Ferguson is not some civil rights example now. Ferguson is where they had riots after a black man, Michael Brown was shot to death by a white cop whom Michael Brown had already gone after and was in the process of charging. That's what happened when he got shot, according to the five black eyewitnesses that our black attorney general, Eric Holder's DOJ interviewed. That's what happened in Ferguson when they cleared the officer and said that this was Michael Brown's fault, not the fault. That's what led to riots because we had a complicit media that didn't tell the truth. And we had a a Barack Obama presidency in which racial tensions had been inflamed already. And now she has the nerve to raise it, Stu, and compare it to Little Rock. Never mind those morons on the floor of the Tennessee legislature. Well, none of that matters. There's way too many facts, Megan, for this debate. It's all supposed to be about emotion and oppression and these predetermined categories of people that were supposed to judge based on their skin color. 
Um, you know, and I, I honestly, I, I keep coming back to this and I don't know that it's going to work out. Seems like nothing ever works out sometimes, but it does feel like an incredible opportunity for conservatives and those on the right. You know, for a hundred years, rightly, Republicans were very closely associated with racial justice in so many different ways. And through the 60s and, you know, I don't know, till what period, the, the left was able to sort of successfully in the public mind wrestle that away. And I think, you know, the at the time, the idea was, well, we shouldn't be judging people based on their immutable characteristics. It would be ridiculous to judge people based on their eye color. Why would we do it on their skin color? And so there was that was a concept that I think most people all agreed with. And Republicans were constantly always on the defensive saying, no, I swear, we don't we don't want to judge people based on skin color. We don't do that. And they were trying they were constantly defending themselves from those accusations. And then along came the Ibram X. Kendi's of the world and the Kamala Harris's of the world and the Joy Reid's of the world who have handed on a silver platter this idea that now they're going to be the ones that are judging people based on skin color. They are handing this issue to conservatives and conservatives agree with the vast majority of people on this issue that people should be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. They want to reverse that and, and the, the right and conservatives and Republicans or whatever group you want to talk about needs to be much more vocal about what they mean. It's not just fighting back against the idiocy of the left, but it's also embracing the fact that we believe we are the side that believes merit is what is important in a person. Character is what is important, not skin color, not eye color. This is something that I think has not been available to conservatives or Republicans for 30 or 40 years. It, it can't be an opportunity that is missed. Mm -hmm. mm. And you still have, earlier this week, you had Michelle Obama out there talking about how unfair America is to black people. Michelle Obama, still bitching about how unfair America is. That last night, while we were all watching the Iowa caucuses, they held the Emmys, you know, the awards. Dave, this used to be your business, kind of. You were in entertainment, you were in acting. Broadway more, mm -hmm. I understand, but not. But in any event, it was acting. And um, the woman who won, was it Best Actress? Uh, Nicey Naz gets up there and instead of saying Nash and gets, I, I never, I don't know her and I didn't, I don't think I watched the show, but in any event, uh, she gets up there and instead of saying, you know, this is a great country to live in, a girl like me can win, whatever the backstory is, usually it's a destitution derby for all these winners and they tell you how they overcame all the odds to win and here I am only in America. And she went a different way. Take a listen to her. And you know who I want to thank? I want to thank me. <laughs> For believing in me and doing what they said I could not do. I accept this award on behalf of every black and brown woman who has gone unheard yet over policed, like Glenda Cleveland, like Sandra Bland, like Breonna Taylor. As an artist, my job is to speak true to power, and baby, I'm gonna do it to the day I die. I'm sorry. Right. She was, I guess, best supporting actress in Dahmer. Brianna Taylor. I mean, Brianna Taylor, unfortunately, got shot because the cops came into her home, which they suspected of being involved in drug deals, and her boyfriend shot a cop in the femoral artery. That will lead police to start shooting. And you don't want to be anywhere near that man when something like that happens. The, like the revisionist history on all of this. And by the way, that too wound up being a black attorney general who did not think charges were appropriate against those cops um, in Kentucky, Daniel Cameron. So whatever, all this, it doesn't stop her from having her moment. She's gonna get up there. She's gonna make her award about the system, the bad cops, the over-policing, and yet the unheard. Are, we have a black vice president, a black woman who's a vice president, right? There's just nothing. There's no amount America can do. Give reparations, elect as president, elect as vice president, attorney general, Supreme Court justices for people like this who just refused to, to acknowledge they're not oppressed. Yeah, um, look, I, I mean, first of all, like what the hell did any of that have to do with the Emmys? Um, but yeah, I, I mean, that's right. This, this reminds me of the director from Disney who says that her job as a film director is to make white people uncomfortable. Well, well, why? Right. I mean, like, why is that your job? And it is. It's it's this sort of like CRT paradigm of, of this notion of speaking truth to power. And look, 
I'm all for speaking truth to power. I mean, I'm a journalist who believes in the old H.L. Mencken saw of comforting the afflicted and, and afflicting the comfortable. I'll, I'll go after Donald Trump and Elon Musk and all those people. I'm not a big fan of billionaires and stuff. But what she's doing isn't speaking truth to power. What, what she's doing is being a megaphone for power, that power being people like Kamala Harris and, and, and people like Michelle Obama. And ultimately, the, the problem with all of this is that it's not aspirational, right? Yesterday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And, and what he said was that he had gotten to the top of the mountain and he saw this promised land. He could describe it. None of these people can describe what the promised land looks like. They they instead envision an America of, of just perpetual race grievance. And I'm really sorry to say this, but it's starting to infect the right as well. I mean, we're starting to see white conservatives who are basically saying, like, fuck you, I'm oppressed, right? I'm the one that that affirmative action works against. And, and there, I, I warned about this years ago, that if you say to white people, I need you to sit with your whiteness and really think about it, I said, it's a horrible idea because they will become more tribal just like everybody else. And that is absolutely the worst case scenario for the United States of America, and it scares the hell out of me. Yeah. You know, Stu, it's, it is it is disturbing to see so many of our so-called leaders, whether it's the vice president or a primetime cable news host over on MSNBC uh, or the best supporting actress constantly, or the DA down in Georgia who's prosecuting a former and would be next president, constantly playing the race card, constantly. And no matter what is achieved, it's not, yeah, I made it. This is a great country. It's Despite the disgusting country I live in, I made it. And I now speak for all the victims of this horrible place. Um, then you've got people like Shelby Steele, right? And his son, Eli Steele. It remains one of my favorite episodes of all time on this show. Steve Krakauer will get me the episode number where they came on together to promote their movie, which you can and still should watch, uh, What Killed Michael Brown. Speaking of Ferguson, they took a deep dive. These are two black men who took a deep dive in it. Eli Steele yesterday, and I recommend following on e Eli on X all the time. It's episode 30, so it's very early on in our tenure. Tweeted out the following. Um, he's quoting Thelonious Monk. They tried to get me to hate white people, but someone would always come along and spoil it. Great. That's the spirit, mm. right? That that times, you know, in, ad infinitum is what we need. Not this other line of constant grievance. Yes, it is the difference between seeing someone as an individual and seeing someone as a member of a group. Are you just a member of some gelatinous sort of glob of white people or brown people or whatever you want, whatever group you want to talk about? Or are you dealing with actual individuals? I can't imagine in, in their everyday lives that this is how they react to white people who come they come across who are their waiters at restaurants. Did they treat them terribly because they think their ancestors oppressed their ancestors? Seeing people as individuals instead of a members of group of, of a group solves all of this, right? Like it solves all of this. And it is a really dangerous road to go on. I'm, I'm so glad, uh, Dave, you brought that up uh, about how both sides are starting to get into this. I remember Barry Weiss bringing this up uh, a while ago, and I think it's really smart in that if you go and you you constantly tell people for a generation that race is the most important thing about you, what do you think that leads to? If you reach, if you tell people for a long period of time, not just people of color, but you're also telling white people the most important thing about you is your race. That's why you're a racist. That's why you're bad. That's why you need to constantly uh, have reparations of, of what are the emotional or monetary sword. And you do that to a generation. What do you think that's going to cause down the line? What did that cause? I mean, this is what they did in Europe in World War II. Teach people that their race was the most important thing about them. That's how you had to think about the world. That leads to terrible, terrible outcomes. Some of the darkest outcomes in our history. It's not something you want to play with. Convince people that they are just people. You can talk to them. It doesn't matter. The least important thing about them is the color of their skin. That is the path to freedom and happiness between races when we stop thinking about that all the time. And I, I don't know where that plot got lost, but it is in the burning dumpster fire right now. Yeah, but we have to sit there and listen to these MSNBC anchors lament the racism of the Republican Party. Of it, it's That's all their party, guaranteed. And we know for sure for a couple of them. Um, but, you know, 
Preacher, heal thyself. Take a hard look inside and figure out what you're doing to the national conversation and why we have the rise of people like Donald Trump, who may be controversial, but are fighting back against the nonsense. Guys, thank you so much. A pleasure. As always, Stu and Dave, you're the best. Tomorrow, Michael Knowles will be here. See you then.